Earl Saxon from Rios Partners in London. Uh, Martin suggested that adaptation has been the taboo of the last decade. I wonder whether four degrees Celsius is the taboo uh, du jour, to mix languages. Um, so I, I would ask Phil and Kathy to respond. How are private investors and how are the multilateral banks uh, at least thinking about a four degree world and how their adaptation efforts would be different in those circumstances? It's uh, Hans Seebrecht from the Norwegian Agency for Development Corporation. Uh, I'm struck with the panelists here that you seem to have a pretty loose, uh, uh, a pretty loose definition of adaptation. Uh, I'm left with the feeling that adaptation equals development in most of the interventions here. Uh, I'm also struggling to attract finance to adaptation. I think uh, you mentioned that it's difficult to attract uh, finance uh, for specific adaptation projects. And in essence, I think that, uh, that's my reflection of uh, lots of the interventions there, that we are in essence talking about basic development. I'm also a board member of the Adaptation Fund board, and it's my task to come up with financing adaptation, concrete, I don't like the word concrete, but that's, uh, uh, but concrete adaptation projects. And when I've been listening to you, is it going to be difficult for us to finance concrete adaptation projects? So if you have any guidance that you might like to offer to us, I think we would be grateful for that. The flippant answer is I'm out of here because um, it's a very scary prospect. Uh, you know, looking at, at, at forestry risk as we do, I sometimes wonder if I'm completely insane working in this space. So that's the perception. You know, people have lost money on insuring forests for, for some structural reasons rather than the forests themselves. But um, so four degrees really, really scares me, uh, I have to say. And it's the sort of conditions where actually you would need government intervention with some sort of loss stop fund to make sure that insurers didn't go under, no matter how big they were, depending on the, the portfolio of risk. So I think that's a very scary prospect. Um, adaptation, quite agree. Well, I'm the master of woolly thinking, so hold my hand up on that. But uh, in terms of finance, and I'm coming back now to the first question, if I may, and, th and that is that, um, in fact, I've spent about, I suppose, about 20 years in agricultural extension and development, and within the reinsurance community, designing schemes. So I was perhaps one of the largest ones we designed, with 46,000 growers of rice in Malaysia, where we were working from the village right up to Bank Nagara and sorting out who took which part of the risk, how, how, how we uh, assess the loss, you know, and th this, th th the whole thing. And really what we're doing is, is we're linking the macro, which we've heard about uh, here, to the specific, which is the farmers. And don't forget, for f farmers are investors, risk takers, decision makers, very intelligent people if you give them the right conditions. And you know, one, one of the things to do is to give them the same access to finance as perhaps the rest of us, which is all about securitizing their, their crops, if it's crops that we're looking at, or forests or whatever, so they can access loans. And once you do that, of course, you then have parameters around such loans, which are used in, in, in Europe, in Spain, the very specific management for forests that attract tax breaks and so on. So if you wrap those two things together, you can encourage um, much more local action supported by, by the structural policy, but giving the, the, the part of the farmers to make those decisions. One other thing I would add, of course, the, the lost data would indicate that farmers shouldn't do what they want to do in certain areas. I mean, I've, we have worked in Syria. Uh, I can't quite remember the nature of the policy, but it was a one in three risk. Why are we trying to do whatever it was in that particular part of Syria? Crazy. So, you know, change your policy to, to, to match the risk. Is that adaptation? I don't know. Anyway, so, um, you know, I, I, I feel very strongly that the, this sort of interplay between the private finance sector and, and farmers encouraged by government uh, can actually produce probably a faster rate of change than the, the mega plans. I mean, the mega plans are needed. You need that framework, but you also need something that works at the local level. And when things go wrong and there's a major loss, what does the insurance policy do? It gives that farmer a title, a legal title to compensation, which he does not have or she does not have in the event of disaster payments, because they are distributed in a different way. And that's a very important thing to, to consider. 
I wanted to mainly um, discuss the issue of adaptation versus development, because I think this is the piece that is really bedeviling us all, and, um, and refer to the study that we put out that, that um, my colleague on the table um, didn't feel was, was um, very well substantiated. This is one that we've just put out on the economics of, of adaptation to climate change, where we tried to answer what is really the additional cost over and beyond what we should be investing today in poverty alleviation and development. So try to, to at least see, can you sort of define what you would have been wanting to um, invest um, using our regular um, public and private programs um, and government's own resources and people's own resources to develop and assuming a development path? And then how would that path um, deviate because of climate? And there where we found the bill for the deviation piece was 75 to 100 billion dollars a year, but that does not include, and very correctly um, stated, um, the impacts on ecosystems, um, because we just couldn't, in the, the time frame of this study that we do, did actually figure out how to how to monetize that. So it is a, a floor; it's not um, the the final bill, and it assumes um, the continued um, uh, strong support through regular um, development channels. Now, why is it so hard to figure out what, what needs to be done? There's some things that you're just going to have to do um, uh, because of the changing climate and do them more. So that's a lot on capacity building. Um, new types of approaches for areas, for example, that are um, had reasonably stable systems in place for water management and forestry management and agriculture management that's changing dramatically. So those countries that are suffering from, from glacial melt, that is, you can actually figure out what is the new um, and additional cost uh, that's going to be associated with, with the changing climate. Other areas is much trickier. So in agricultural systems, um, well, we should have been investing as we speak over the last several, many years, on improved um, agricultural practices and in enhancing the programs that, that we've got in many of the, the centers of the CGIR and the like on new seed varieties and the like. It just uh, means that we're going to do it more and faster. So there's an additional bill there, but it's not a different um, work stream than should have happened um, as, as in any case. Um, uh, other things are also very difficult. Should you be putting cities near, near um, uh, you know, vulnerable coastlines? Do you need to sort of change the city form? Is it about totally different like thinking about um, uh, city management and, and the like? Again, very difficult to say, was that a, actually a, a development question or is that a, a um, resilience question? It's both um, simultaneously. So we're thinking um, in the work that we're doing is that um, while there will be some project-based things, glacial melt, um, new um, water infrastructure, uh, that the flows of funds that are going to be coming, that may be coming hopefully through the negotiations, probably have to be directed to governments and communities to service their broad development needs. And just to think then about how you deliver that in an integrated way. So yes, more costly um, uh, water management systems, but let's not have a water management system for adaptation and one for regular pieces, but let's just get those, fun, those fun, um, flows of funds scaled up um, quite dramatically going forward. So m sector wide approaches, um, approaches that um, speak to um, the development planning piece, but additional resources um, on top of regular ODA critical.